This morning, uh, I've entitled this God's Thrones and the Battles. Now, I may have touched on this uh, earlier on, and uh, we, uh, like some of this, you know, when you, and look, I, I have sat in meetings and you go, oh, man, this is going to be a boring one. Uh, I, I don't want it to be that. Uh, I want this to be uh, something that kind of makes you think and and helps you to try and understand the things that are that are going on uh, in this world at this time. Over the past few months, we've we've shared with you some of the headlines of what is, according to Scripture, going to happen on the face of this earth. And who will take part in its turmoil, if you will, or be an instigator in it? And who's going to live through these awful times? Uh, and and that I, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Uh, oh, you know me that way, anyway. Um, but what I want to do uh, now, what I'd like to do, is to follow up. Uh, you know, on the on the fine print, as they say, some guys are headlines and some guys are fine print. And uh, I just want to share you with you some of the fine print today. And one of the things we have to do here in especially North America, never mind the rest of the world, uh, this is where we're located in North America. We got to get rid of this uh, North American antinomian and Baptocostal mentality. Um, you know, we especially this time of year, we see this sweet white porcelain baby Jesus with a Pillsbury Doughboy angels floating around his bed as the pagan nations celebrate his birth and spend and spend and spend. Next week, it is our desire to go in depth, depth scripturally as to the timing of the birth of our Messiah, Yeshua. And I, I think most of you know by now it's not December 25th. And there's a lot of guys teaching on this, but I just want to share with you next week uh, from uh, a scriptural perspective. And then you can decide, right? Then you can decide. One of the things we have to understand is this. We're talking about the creator of all. A creator of all. And that is Yeshua, a merciful judge who has the final authority over all things. We're going to be in, begin our journey this morning in uh, Colossians 1, starting in the 15th verse. And this is talking about the preeminence of our Messiah, Colossians 1, 15. A lot of scripture today, guys, so I'm going to run uh, through it probably uh, a little on the speedy side. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He is supreme over all his creation because in connection with him were all things created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or lordships, rulers or authorities, Elohim. They've all been created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and he holds everything together. Also, he is the head of the body, the, mess the messianic community, not the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might hold first place in everything. Now, I, I, I said the word church there because there is such a blame thing here in North America, where the church is the be-all and end-all, and in so many occasion, instances, rather, it is an abomination. Verse 19, for it pleased God to have his full being live in his offspring, his son, and through his son to reconcile to himself all things. That's A-L-L, -L, all things, whether on earth or in heaven making peace through him, through having his son shed his blood by being executed on the stake. Now, whether, and I think most of you do, but, you know, we're getting new people who are coming online all the time, searching for some truth. And 
one of the things the truth is that there are two realms out there, out here. Two realms of existence, the seen and the unseen in our average everyday uh, experience, right? The unseen realm, my brothers and sisters, are all around us, so don't forget that. See, both were created by Jehovah, Yehoshua, Jesus. They were both created by him. He is the creator. The invisible realm has a complete view of the seen realm. I mean, the invisible realm where the angelic forces are, the spirits are, where the demons are, where the thrones are, where the gods are, have a complete view of the realm that we live in, where the human race lives. And of a truth, most know very little about the fact that there are other dimensions, seen and unseen. Now, the Apostle Paul, he, he confirms this in, in 1 Corinthians 2.9, and it says there, 1 Corinthians 2.9, But as the Tanakh says, or as it is written, No eye has seen, no ear heard, and no one's heart even imagined all the things that Yahweh has prepared for those who love him. Let that sink in. We try to, as this word here says, imagine what the things are that Yahweh's got planned. We have got no flipping idea, you know. Whatever the best, most perfect thing that you can imagine is probably at the low end of the totem pole. Like, we just don't know. And isn't it a blessing that we don't, that it will be a big surprise to those who love him and keep his commandments, right? See, the Torah views the angelic realm and and, and humankind, uh, the ones that have been, and I'm going to use the word reborn, uh, the ones who have accepted the fact of the death and resurrection uh, of Messiah, that the Torah looks at us as, as one family, not, not two separate entities. We are joined at the hip because of the what? The mediator, Yeshua. You see, he sees the finished product. He sees the finished product, my brothers and sisters, that will traverse, and I'm going to use this word, the eternity. And eternity is timeless. Get a little bit more on that later. Ephesians 1.5, Ephesians 1.5, he determined in advance that through Yeshua, the Messiah, we would be his sons in keeping with his pleasure and purpose, so that we would bring him praise, commensurate with the glory and the grace he gave us through the beloved one. In union with him through the shedding of his blood, we talked about that the other day, set free our sins forgiven. And this accords with the wealth of his grace. He has lavished on us all his wisdom and insight. Do you really believe that? Do I really believe that? That he has lavished on us all his wisdom and insight. Just talked about yesterday, discernment. He has made known to us his secret plan by which his own will he designed beforehand in connection with Messiah. With connection with Messiah. And will put into effect when the time is right. You know, we want to push things along, don't we? His plan to place everything in heaven and on earth under Messiah's leadership. Headship. One of the things that you know that I push and I push hard is that we have to remember that the family only consists of those who adhere to his holy covenant. It's a blood covenant. If not, then you are outside or an outsider. And then Yeshua even says, well, get away from me because I never had a relationship with you. Because you were what? Complacent with Torahlessness, lawlessness, iniquity. 
And you see, this is a spot here where I could get off on a real rabbit trail and talk about Paul versus the uh, versus the law study. Now, in the archives, and I don't know how deep they are on our website, um, there should be 40 some hours worth of, uh, yes, boring at times, yet a trove of insight, my brothers and sisters, to help us understand the truth of the word, not as the first church of the righteous has taught us. And like, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? So study this out in, when you have time. Actually, uh, the book of Galatians is, is a treasure trove. If you will look at it through the eyes that the law has not been done away with. And even when you go into Romans and so on and so forth, you will see the truth of his word. What most will never realize is that our time on earth here is like a training ground for eternity. See, th this is such a temporal world that you and I live in. And if we buy into the concept of sin and its consequences and the redemption through Messiah, and for those who don't have this type of understanding, there is a cause and effect. You see, the Father made us free will instruments. The choice of the future and where we live, it's up to us. It isn't up to the Father. We do it. We do it. We make the choice, not him. Now, we know that at conception, our spirits enter into these bodies, and that would be the real us, the real you, the real me, from that other realm or that other dimension. And we have shared with you more than once, and I call this a Stevie 101, because uh, I don't want to say something here that is untrue, but understand the heart from where I'm coming from. You see, to me, it was our reluctance to make a decision in the heavens. There's like, like I talked about the third, the third, and the third for easy reference, right? A third went with uh, the devil and his boys. A third are up in heaven worshiping and carrying on. And there's a third that were relegated uh, to this world to make a choice because why he wanted to see the father wanted to see which side we were going to hook up with i mean how many billions of our years were we not there in the heavens seeing what was going on with lucifer and his bunch see the spirits in the other world cannot see what the father sees when time is up. And because of the love of the Father, he wants everyone to make a choice, the correct choice. You see, only the Father knows when time's up. And when he sends that angel and he puts one foot in the water and one foot in the land, says, okay, that's it, boys and girls, time's up. You've made your decision. Tests over, hand in your paperwork. And uh, yeah, that's the way it's going to go. Time, time, time was created before the sun and the moon. And then in Revelations, like I said, all of a sudden, time's up. This earth, my brothers and sisters, is like a filter, a cosmic one, so that by free will, he, what, is left with the cream of the crop so that he can get on with his plans for his family a united family, a one family. That is what he intended when we started out in Eden. And what was Eden? It was life outside of time. And that's probably the true definition of eternity. Life outside of time. 
So what do we got to do? We got to choose who we're going to serve. In Joshua 24, 14, therefore fear Yahweh and serve him truly and sincerely. Put away the gods of your ancestor, serve beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve Yahweh. If it seems bad to you to serve Yehovah, then choose today whom you're going to serve. Will it be the gods of your ancestor, serve beyond the river? or the gods of the Amorai in the land who you are living. And as for me and my household, we will serve Yahweh. Now the Amorai, these were the gods as, as we understand it, the gods of the underworld, the Anaku, A-N-A-K-U. You see, the main purpose of Messiah was to bring the family together as a unit. And we haven't arrived yet. I think we all know and understand that. Yet we are getting closer and closer. If we can get this antinomian crap out of the way and our own selfish lifestyles. In Ephesians, there's a heavy duty. Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, I fall on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth receives its character. Wow. The family in heaven and the family on earth. You see how we're all intertwined, interconnected? I pray that from the treasures of his glory, he will empower you with inner strength by his spirit. How many of us right now need that inner strength? We need it. We have to rely on it. Never mind this flesh boohoo crap that so many people seem to be going through. It's not about now, even though now is real. It's about the eternity and what you and I have, have to go through here to get us into position so we understand the truth of that. Ephesians 3.17, so that the Messiah may live in your hearts through your trusting. That's called faith. And I pray that you will be rooted and founded in love. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, love has to be tough. Love has to be tough. I heard a guy the other day share how he had one of his sons say something and that wasn't too kosher about a family member. And the dad says, well, okay, I guess you're old enough. We'll go for a beer. So he took him for a beer and he says, you're a man. No, he says, no, no, I'm only 16. He says, well, you, the way you talked, you were a man. No, no, I'm only 16. And the old man turned around and he took his fist and he plowed him right in the head. And after he plowed him in the head and he gave him a hug and he said, I love you. But if you ever do that again, I'm going to do the same damn thing to you again. There's a lesson in that for us, my brothers and sisters. How many times have we not said, I'm old enough, I know everything, and go out and do your own thing, and then bam, life hits you right smack upside the head. And then the father gives us a hug and says, hey, listen, I love you, but I don't want you to do that again. Did we learn? Do we learn? I hope so. Getting back to the family thing theme here. Judah, Joseph, Ephraim. You see, we're so bitterly divided. Judah cannot handle a pork-eating Jesus. And why should they? He was, he was a Jew. Come on. And Ephraim can't handle the fact that the written word of Yahweh was not done away with. For they see the oral law of Moses. What? As truth, oral law, confusion, confusion. And as Ephraimites, when is the last time, my brother or my sister, that you have thanked the Father for Judah in this day and age for shedding its blood to defend the land that belongs to all 12 tribes? to which we are going to be gathered back to. When's the last time you thanked him?
what we need to realize is that the father will restore his family and he will restore all of his creation the way it was before the sons of God fell and screwed it all up, pun intended. Can you imagine all of creation, like the fifth planet that had to be destroyed? Now, I'm talking about the fifth planet, the fifth planet that used to be there. There's a big void there. And if you look at the calculations, as some have done, and I, I looked into this years ago, uh, it, it, everything is symmetrical, except this one spot. There's a big hole up in the cosmos. It had to be destroyed because of total depravity. Being restored. Here's the definition. Plus whatever else there was. What am I talking about? Okay. Go to Psalm 89, verse 10. Psalm 89, verse 10. Thou hast broken Rahab, what used to be the fifth planet, in pieces as the one slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. Now, this is in Psalm 89, 10. Now, if you slip over to Isaiah 51, 9, awake, awake, put on the strength of arm of Yahweh, awake in the ancient of days and the generation of old. Thou, art thou not it? The strength, the arm. The one who has control that hath cut Rahab, wounded the dragon. You're referring, obviously, to Lucifer. We can find a, re uh, 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 a reference to that in Revelation 12, 9. I'll just read it quick. That great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, also known as the devil, Satan, adversary, obviously, and then the deceiver of the whole world. He was hurled down to earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. And if you read Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, that's a prime example of what happened. And now that, that's that gap theory that we've talked about. Ezekiel 28, 17. Ezekiel 28, 17. Your heart grew proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. But I've thrown you to the ground before kings. I have made you a spectacle. Talking about Lucifer. By your enemies... Oh, sorry, by your crimes in dishonest trading, you have profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I brought you forth fire from within you, and it has devoured you. Ever heard the old saying, man alive, that person's on fire, and it can be good or it can be bad. It's devoured you. I reduce you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who can see you. All who know you among the peoples will be aghast at you. You are an object of terror and you will cease to exist. Quite a prophecy. Why? He is a pathetic piece of crap. And we as humans, when we take on the Father, what happens? When you and I take on the Father, through his holy son. What do we do? We increase in stature and in countenance. You can tell if somebody, you know, is 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 a, a person who has accepted Messiah, filled with the Spirit of God. They have a, a countenance about them. They don't walk around mealy mouth, bitching and complaining. They have a smile on their face. They're happy. Why? Because they rely on Yahweh for all things. And Lucifer, who was the best of the best in every way, has decreased over time. Because he was what? Relegated to this earth. Time has turned him into a miserable looking weasel of a character. Uh, you can put an image into your head of what he looks like and what have you, if that helps you. But this, this is what he has decreased in countenance, where we have increased in countenance because we have hooked up with the Father and his Holy Son. So what was this pre-Adamic world like? And I'm talking about the time between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. You see, we can only imagine the sum and the total of it. We can only imagine being at and seeing the throne room with all its glory and 
conversing with the sons of Jehovah who sit on the in 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 that boardroom around that boardroom table, the council, which by the way was held in Eden. In Eden, not necessarily in the garden, but in Eden. You see, Scripture says the garden. What is in Eden, in a certain portion of Eden? There's other portions of Eden, paradise. Look, the garden is only part. Just, just, just picture this. Okay, this is the way my mind works, okay? Buildings. Say a convention center where meetings can take place. Tables and chairs. Because we have believed a lie. A wrong image was acted upon. That's exactly what the deceiver and Nechesh did in Eden to Eve and Adam. And it's exactly the same thing that he's doing in the lives of his kids today. Daniel 7, 9. As I watched, thrones were set in place. The ancient one took his seat on one of the thrones. His clothing was as white as the hair on his head and it was pure wool. His throne was with fiery flames with wheels of burning fire. A stream of fire flowed down the present. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. Millions and millions stood before him. Then the court was convened and the books were opened. Now you got to understand. This is talking about the end of the thousand-year reign of Messiah here on this earth, which is in very close proximity as far as uh, the timeline of creation is concerned. Daniel 7, 11, I kept watching then because of the arrogant words which the horn was speaking. I watched the beast, in some translations say the fourth beast, the beast was killed. Its body was destroyed and it was given up to be burned up completely. As for the other beasts, their rulership was taken away and their lives were prolonged for a time and a season for the purposes of Yahweh. See, the term God here, and I'm talking about gods and thrones, but the term or, or, or the word God, G-O-D, or the plural gods, if you read it in the Torah, the Hebrew, the English word for God is not used. It's always Elohim or El. And when the boys in red shoes did their rewriting, some of the interpretation was not too kosher. Let's just put it that way. The word Elohim, it can mean what? The singular, the plural. As an example, if we say sheep, am I talking about one or am I talking about a flock? Also, the word God, it can mean idols, supernatural spirits, religious spirits. And we've talked about this before as to who and where the war is. And it's in the spirit realm, my brothers and sisters. And, you know, when you listen to the um, the uh, the news reports on on the on the. Uh, internet and and things like that and when you listen to people talk they well god this and god that god's a title and in a way i think that our heavenly father obviously knew how we were going to talk he has protected those folks from his real name because they can't abuse it to abuse the word god is is and i be careful how I say that. It's not a biggie. As soon as you start using his real name in vain, look out. That's when we get into trouble. It can mean angels. And obviously the demonic realm, the disembodied spirits of the offspring of the Nephilim. And a human resulting what? In a chimera which produces what demons you got to get this you got to get this in your head you got to get it right how this whole thing is working out and these these are, are are false being or untrue right 
or in direct conflict for or in, in relation to El, the creator, the true Elohim, the true God. And yet, it can also mean divine beings, as we have shared earlier, and it's found in Psalm 89. He says, you, you are gods. And people can't handle that. Everybody thinks there's God and there's devil and there's us and that's it. No, no there's a whole realm of activity out there. In Genesis 1 through verse 25, it's talking about one God, singular, the one and only creator. And we must always remember the context in which the word is used. I'm talking about the word God. And be aware of the wrong interpretation of Scripture. And this is where we as his kids need to understand the context of the subject which is being addressed. This is where it helps to be spirit-filled, my brothers and sisters, so we get the correct direction, discernment, which is a gift. Now, Let's just reaffirm that there was a heavenly council. In Psalm 82, verse 1, Psalm 82, verse 1, Elohim stands in divine assembly where the Elohim judges. How long will you go on judging unfairly, favoring the wicked? Now he's talking about his council, his Elohim. He, 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 there was what, 70 and some say 72 uh, sitting on this council. Ah, a little rain. Thank you, Father. Psalm 82, 3. Give justice to the weak and the father. Uphold the rights of the wretched, the poor. Rescue the des destitute, the needy. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They don't know. They don't understand. They wander about in darkness. Meanwhile, all the foundations of the earth are being undermined. My decree is this, you are Elohim. He's saying you are gods. This is Psalm 82, verse six. You are God, sons of the most high, all of you. Now this next verse here in, in Psalm 82, verse seven, kind of puts things into perspective. Nevertheless, you will die like mortals. Like any prince, you will fall. <laughs> yes, oops. We just had ourselves a little problem here. Just got a death sentence. Rise up, Elohim, and judge the earth for all the nations are yours. Even though he put these gods in a position of authority, they fell. And he tells them you will die like mere men. And it shows us who's in charge because of God. Jehovah, who is in charge. Amen. Amen. Let her reign. We get out ahead of God. And boy, my brothers and sisters, I'll tell you what, I've had to reach him for that man once. See, we used to have this saying, little Tommies. Well, these boys back then, they were little Yehovahs, little Yehovahs. <laughs> In Job 1.6, Satan was allowed to what? He was allowed to test Job. In Job 1 7, it says, Yahweh asked the adversary, Where are you coming from? And the ad adversary answered, uh, From roaming the earth, wandering here and there. And I think most of us know the story of Job. And then in Job 2 1, it says, Job 2 1. Now we, we've jumped chapters here. The other, uh, another day came, and the sons of God came to serve Yahweh. And among them came the adversary to what? To serve. The adversary came to serve God, Yahweh. See, that word there can mean to be accountable to. The adversary had to come and be accountable to Jehovah for what he was doing in the spirit realm. And the father was giving him enough rope to hang himself, right? Job 38, 7. And the morning stars sang together, 
all the sons of God shouted for joy. Psalm 89, 7. No, let's go 89.6. For who in the skies or the Shekinah can be compared to Yahweh? Which of these gods can rival Yahweh? There are other gods, my brothers and sisters. Oh, at what? A God dreaded. He's talking about Yahweh. The great assembly of the holy ones and feared by all around him. How much more proof do we need of the plurality of gods? Now, we've talked about gods. What about thrones? Oh, bless God, I want to get through this. Revelation 7, 10, and they shouted victory to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb of God. And the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living beings. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped Yahweh, saying, the elder here is, if we recall in an earlier definition, is the uh, is the uh, a god with a small g, council member, one who sits on lesser thrones, but is still part of the assembly of the rulers of Elohim. Now, if we slip over to Deuteronomy 33, 2 for a sec, it talks about the myriad of holy ones in his right hand who has a fiery law for them. And that word fiery law is only used once in scriptures. And it has to do with, I truly believe that something is burned to, to your insides, to your conscience, to your very core, to your very understanding that would have to be accounted to his children, his kids. And it would end up the being that, that, that blood covenant through his holy son, the living word. You know that you know that you know. Throughout this whole world right now, the only one that is being uh, uh, talked against, uh, tried to be pulled down to demean is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are no other gods out there that the world is coming against. Darkness doesn't give a double damn about Buddha, about Islam, about anybody. He only cares that he can destroy the creation of Lord God Almighty. And that's why we don't hear about any of these other religions, because he don't give a flip about them. It's the God that you and I believe in. Jehovah and his holy son, Yeshua. Deuteronomy 33, 3, he truly loves the peoples, all his holy ones are in your hand. You know, and one of the things here in Deuteronomy 33, 4, and Moshe commanded us, uh, uh, us an inheritance for the community of, of Yaakov. Now, here again, this uh, kind of a sidebar here, and this is where our brother Judah has got the thing so wrong. You see, the Orthodox boys are so adamant that the Torah was given to them, the oral law, because that's what dominates their very existence, to the point of blindness. Of course, we see that happening in the first church as well. So to continue, the holy ones, the Elohim, uh, those words are interchangeable, and sometimes they're written as angels. And this is something that most have no idea. Most things of Jehovah came by himself to give a law and the instruction. Of God. But did he come alone? You see, was Jehovah going to give his divine laws to his children, you and I and our ancestors, which are his kids, without a witness? Without his divine counsel being present on that day, the divine counsel was there to witness all of creation that his kids just got a heads up. Genesis, or sorry, Galatians 3.19. Wherefore the seventh, sorry, wherefore then serveth the law, all this Elizabethan English. It was added because of transgression. 
till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The law was not done away with by Yeshua. He rightly interpreted it. The word angels could be a play on words. It could be by, by both the promise and angels, right? He promised it through Abraham to Moses, and then it came in the form of Yeshua. In Acts 7, 52 and 53, which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now betrayers and murderers. He don't mince his words. Who have received the instruction book, the law, the Torah, by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. They were there when the Torah was given, part of his holy counsel. In Hebrews 2, verse 2, for if the word of God spoke through angels became binding, so then every violation of the act of disobedience re received its just deserts in full measure. Like even if the angels bring you the bring brought the law, if we don't keep it, we suffer the consequences. You see, it kind of makes you take notice of how our heavenly father operates. And this, this law that the antinomians say is the truth could not be further from the truth. The law, the Torah, the instruction book was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. It was called the spoken word, as we read in Hebrews 2.2 and Daniel 7.10. And that's where we find a great comparison. See, the picture that the Torah sends us is this, that thousands ministered unto him and that the law came from 10,000 on his right hand, meaning authority. What a gift, my brothers and sisters, that the Father has put in place with his divine counsel. And then through John, we see a picture of the heavenly court in Revelations 4.1. After these things I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and a voice like a trumpet which I heard speaking with me before said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after these things. And instantly I was in the Spirit, and there before me in heaven stood a throne, and on the throne someone was sitting. And the one sitting there gleamed like a diamond rubies and a rainbow shining like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, thrones and thrones and more thrones. And the thrones that sat there were 24 elders dressed in white clothing and wearing gold crowns on their heads. Revelation 4, 5, and from the throne came four thunders and lightnings. And before the thrones were seven flaming torches, which are the sevenfold spirit of Yahweh. Sevenfold spirits of Yahweh. Revelation 4.10. The 24 elders fall down before the one sitting in the throne who lives forever and ever and worship him. Worship him. They throw their crowns in front of the throne and say, You are worthy, Adonai, Elohenu, to have glory, honor, and power because you created all things. Yes, because of your will, they were created and came into being. And I tell you that most of the world poo poos this. Well, who created God? God has always been. Jehovah, the creator, has always been. There is no beginning. There is no end. And people can't fathom that because they don't understand the spirit. And there's much talk of late. Much talk of late, especially what's going on in the Middle East and Russia and Ukraine and all the bull crap that North America is putting us into. There's talk of late of the end of the world, Armageddon, Gog and Magog. Even the Jews are talking about it. 
the rapture, if and when, and the ruling and reigning of God's kids when Yeshua comes. So what does the scripture really say? Well, my brothers and sisters, some of you out of there had better get a box of Kleenex. Get ready. Get ready. And Prophet Mike Terry talked into this at Sukkot. Revelation 19, 19, and I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to do battle with the rider of the horse and his army. This is Revelation 19, 19. But the beast was taken captive, and with it the false prophet, who in his presence had done the miracles which he had used to deceive. The false prophet used miracles he used to deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. The beast and the false prophet were both thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Now, in, in that verse there, there is a whole bushel full of information. And it's just fast, bang, bang. But study it out. Read it. And the rest were killed with the sword that goes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse with all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. These are the unrepentant of that time. Revelations 20, verse 1. Next, I saw an angel coming down from heaven who had the keys to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, Satan, the adversary, obviously, changed him for a thousand years chained him for a thousand years. You see, this is what? In complete reference to who it was that was in the garden in Eden with Adam and Eve, the adversary. He threw him into the abyss, locked him, and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive, so that he could not deceive so that he could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were over. And after that, he was to be set free for a little while. Why? When the angel had put this character in a pit, sealed him, chained him up, why would God, Jehovah, Yahweh, say, okay, release him? Got him tied up. Things are good, have been good for a thousand years. Well, you see, life is not a free ride, my brothers and sisters. All these folks that make it through the millennial reign and people will live, they will die, they will procreate. And like I've said before, there will be millions of people that make it to the end of the millennium. They have to be tested. That's why Satan's less loose. Verse 20, uh, sorry, uh, verse 4 on chapter 20. Then I saw thrones and those seated on them to receive authority to judge. Hang on a minute. I saw thrones and those seated on them received authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. for testifying about Yeshua and proclaiming the word of God. Now, I need you to put an asterisk in your notes beside Revelations 20, verse 4, because this is something that I don't think most people realize and understand. Also, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands. Now, there is a... a, 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 a an underlying statement here that these folks who did not receive the mark on the foreheads got beheaded or executed or hung or whatever, shot. But some will make it through without taking the mark. My, my gut. They came to life and ruled with Messiah for a thousand years. Okay. Okay. The people that were beheaded, beheaded or martyred or shot or hung because 
they believed and testified about Yeshua and God, proclaiming his word, they came and ruled, came to life and ruled the Messiah for a thousand years. Well, I thought the rapture was going to come and everybody was going to come alive. No. Right there, it tells you that the ones who are going to rule and reign with Messiah are the ones who put their life on the line like Yeshua did. They said, no, we will not bow the knee to you, darkness. And darkness took care of them, killed them. These are the ones who are going to rule and reign with Messiah through the millennium. Now, I'm going to read in a minute here, 1 Corinthians 15.50, uh, and, and you might be able to put something like this in here because, boy, to try and understand the Hebraic thought and what the Father was really saying. Anyway, Revelations 20, verse 5. This is a key verse, my brothers and sisters. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years was over. Until the thousand years was over. So you get the average believer who was not martyred, killed, didn't live in a time when they had to take a mark. They stayed in paradise, the holding room, call it what you want, for a thousand years. And it says, this is the first resurrection. Now, who's he talking about? He's talking about those who were martyred, killed, executed, because they would not bow the knee to darkness. They didn't come alive until the white throne judgment. thousand years, my brothers and sisters, of our reckoning of time. You see, when, when you're in paradise, when you're in the garden, Scripture talks about a day being a thousand years, a thousand years being a day, no time. So if there is this stretch of time for a thousand years where Messiah reigns, and the souls of those who had died believing in Messiah Okay, right from the beginning of time, even from the ones that the Messiah took out of Abraham's bosom and showed him the truth, they didn't come alive, and they're not going to come alive until such time as they are called on at the end of the thousand years. And we got to understand that. We got to understand there are very few. And that can be debated as to how many who are going to rule and reign with Messiah through the thousand years. I'll tell you, very few. Blessed and holy is anyone who has part in the first resurrection. Those are the ones who stood up for Yeshua and it cost them their life. Over them, the second death has no power. On the contrary, they will be koanim, priests of Yahweh and of the Messiah, and they will rule with him a thousand years. To me, it looks like all believers who die will be resurrection, resurrected, or will not, rather, be resurrected at the time that the Messiah returns, guys. Now, here's one for you. A change is going to happen. A change is going to happen to believers. And this is going to be at the end of the millennial reign, right? When the dead in Messiah, well, when the, I, I, this is a 7,000 year deal. When the dead in Messiah will bounce out of their graves, and those that are alive at that time will change or be reborn. Again, into a new heaven and a new earth. Now, I told you earlier, I was going to read 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now, here we go. 
let me say this, brothers, fresh, flesh and blood cannot share the kingdom of God, nor can something that decays share what does not decay. Look, I will tell you a secret. Not all of us will die, but we will be changed. It will take but a moment, the blink of an eye at the final shofar, for the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised for uh, to live forever. And we too will be changed. That's the ones who are alive, right? And and the scripture talks about the fa the fact we're not going to be changed uh, before the dead and Messiah who are raised. They're going to be changed first, then the rest of us. Revelation 27, and when the thousand years are over, the adversary will be set free from his prison. He will go out and deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for the battle. Their number is countless as the sand of the seashore. And they came up over the breadth of the land and surrounded the camp of God's people and the city that he loves. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And everybody thinks that after the seven, not everybody, I got to be careful what I say. There are a lot of people out there who think that at at the end of the uh, seven-year tribulation period when the Messiah returns, that we're going to see this Gog and Magog war. No, it won't happen for a thousand years, okay? And the adversary who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were, and they tormented day and night forever. And then what happens? The judgment of the white throne. In Revelations 20, 11, and I saw a great white throne, the one sitting on it, earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing in front of the throne. The books were open, and another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to what they had done. That's the time that people received their crowns and the sea gave up the dead and the dead in Sheol gave up the dead in them and they were judged each according to what he had done and death and Sheol were hurled into the lake of fire this is the second death the lake of fire anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire there are many, my brothers and sisters, whose name may yours and mine be among them, who are not written in the book of life. Many, many. And Yeshua says, look, pay attention, guys. I'm coming soon, and my rewards are with me to give each person according to what he has done. <laughs> oh, bless God. Forgive us for what we haven't done. He says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. How blessed are those who wash their robes so they have a right to eat from the tree of life and go through the gates of the holy city. And outside the gates are the homosexuals, those involved with the occult and the drugs and the sexually immoral, murderers, idol worshipers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And it is blatant all over this earth the falsehoods practice falsehoods take the manna it'll save you take seven pieces of manna i Yeshua, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the messianic communities i am the root and the offspring of david the bright and morning star the spirit and the bride say come let anyone who hears say come let anyone who is thirsty come let anyone who wishes take the water of life it is free of charge there is no cost I warn everyone hearing the words of this prophecy, this book, that if anyone adds, anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues written in this book. And if anyone takes away anything from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city as described in this book. The one who is testifying 
to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Yeshua. And then he ends in Revelations with, may the grace of the Lord Yeshua be with you all. And so it is, my brothers and sisters. So it is. Don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. Don't have fear of the enemy. For your life, our lives are in good hands. If we be martyred, so be it. Look at it this way. You will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. If not, you will go to paradise, wait out the time, and when that time comes, we will be resurrected first. Those who are there changed in a moment of time, and we enter into the new heaven and the new earth. Praise be his holy name. Amen. Father, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. Thank you for clarity. Thank you for hope that springs eternal. And Father, we bring before you Brother Judah, who is going through hell. Thank you, Father, that they are rooting out all evil. They're rooting out all evil, Father. Thank you that Judah has shed her blood, Father, for the whole family. For the whole family, Father. Forgive us, Father, for not acknowledging that. Forgive me, I should say, for not acknowledging that enough. Praise be your holy name. Praise be your holy name. Be with those families, Father, in the Middle East that are going through this hell. And be with all your kids, no matter what country of this world that they are in, who are being buffeted by the adversary. Father, Put your hand over them, protect them, give them solace, give them hope, Father. That there is a reward, Father. That there is a reward for sticking with you. Have mercy, Father. Have mercy on us, your children, in these days, weeks, months, and years ahead. For you said there will never be a time like it. There never has been, never will be. Father, have mercy in Yeshua's name. Amen. Until next time, my brothers and sisters, shalom.